name is Chris Sawin, and I'm pleased to welcome John McCord uh, from the Coastal Studies Institute to the Courthouse Session Speaker Series. Um, anyone like me who's had the good fortune of uh, working at, uh, with the folks at Coastal Studies Institute, uh, especially if you've been involved in the field uh, of the arts, uh, has, has, uh, all, has long thought that we ought to be celebrating the artistry of the work that is done by the technologists and the scientists there. Uh, some of the work that they do is just stunning visually. Um, they have uh, great connections um, uh, with universities throughout the world. And I've had the good fortune of knowing John for some time and seeing his work uh, and had talked to him uh, on a number of occasions about doing something like this. So we're just thrilled to have him here for the fifth installment of Dare County Arts Council's Courthouse Speaker Series. This is a program that brings cultural scholars from a variety of disciplines to our local folks here in Dare County and online uh, audiences. We'll have one presentation every month between now and the uh, end of December. And if you uh, like what you're seeing, please check back to uh, darearts.org to see the additional uh, uh, sessions on our schedule. Um, as I mentioned, I've known John for some time uh, and uh, had a chance to work with a lot of folks over at CSI. They've been great partners of ours. John graduated from UNC Wilmington with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Natural Resource Recreation Management. After that, he went to work at Fort Fisher, so he was in the, the aquarium system here in North Carolina. And then after that, he, uh, in 1996, uh, went to the Aquarium of the Pacific uh, in Long Beach. And for anybody who's been there, that's an amazing facility. And John uh, was involved uh, as they constructed a lot of that facility. In 2005, he came uh, to Dare County uh, and uh, joined Coastal Studies Institute as their educational programs coordinator. Uh, in 2015 or thereabouts, he became the assistant director of Coastal Study to in Studies Institute for Public Engagement. And he works on all their non-academic programming now, all their communication pieces. And um, in addition to his love of outdoor sports and the ocean, uh, he is a wonderful photographer. And I think that's where we'll uh, kick it off tonight. Um, uh, we really want to celebrate John uh, tonight as an artist. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to him now, and he's going to share image, images with you, tell you a little bit about how uh, they came to pass. And uh, without any other uh, introduction, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. And uh, thanks for everybody who came out tonight to um, hear me talk, both in person as well as uh, virtually. I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully some of you have had a chance to visit the Coastal Studies Institute, this image that's up on the screen. Um, we realize the value of digital media and the ability to use that digital media to communicate our message. So I would encourage you, if you haven't, visit our YouTube channel. We have over 160 videos on our YouTube channel, everything from hour-long lectures to many documentaries, to faculty highlights, to uh, educational programs, things for kids. We have a kitchen science series, which is a fun educational program for um, young adults and their parents and teachers to bring science to life, either in your kitchen and at home or in your classroom. Um, but I've had the good fortune to work with our scientists to help communicate their work. One of the ways that uh, I do that is through photography. One of the great things about CSI is that the researchers really engage the educators and communicators in their work. And we really work alongside those scientists to help them communicate their work and head into the field with them. We do this in a variety of different ways, right? We do it both aerially with drone work. We are in the lab with the scientists. We go on the research vessels as part of the research projects with them. We do a lot of what I would call terrestrial-based coverage. But one of the things that really gets me excited and is being able to take that imagery and go underwater with it as well. And so that's really what I want to focus on today is um, some of my work as it relates to underwater photography and how we use that for science and some of the stories behind some of the images. I've been really fortunate to be a part of the scientific dive team with the Coastal Studies Institute since 2006. I'm a, um, an avid diver both in my work as well as um, with my family and on, uh, on my own free time and um, have spent a lot of time and energy getting trained up to be able to do some of the things that we do. And just wanted to share some of the different 
uh, images that I've been able to capture over the years and some of the stories behind some of those images. So up on the screen now you can see that's me um, with an open circuit system and one of our underwater camera systems. I do both underwater photography and videography. Um, photography, as you well know, is not a cheap endeavor. And one of the things that, um, that uh, I like to say when people ask about underwater photography in terms of how do you get into it and how much does it cost, and the only thing more expensive than photography is underwater photography. Um, and so we're fortunate enough to, through grants and being able to um, work with partners and generate revenue and funds to be able to purchase equipment, we're able to work with some of the top tier equipment that's out there. And so we use, um, we use digital cinema cameras underwater, the same kind of cameras that, uh, that filmmakers use to, to make major motion pictures. And we use the latest in DSLR and now mirrorless technology. Um, it's not really the camera that makes the image, but it certainly doesn't hurt to have top quality gear that you trust underwater. Some of this gear is quite large. So you'll notice the camera that I'm holding in this image here. Um, that is a, a red uh, Dragon system, which is a 6K. It's nine times high definition, so it's ultra high definition. It's a, an underwater cinema camera. And in the housing, with the lights and the housing and all the things that go along with it, the camera weighs somewhere around 75, 80 pounds. And on land, I'm burdened down. In this case, I have a set of doubles. Some, in some of the images, you'll see me with a rebreather, another piece of underwater scuba technology. I've got an extra 100 or so pounds of gear on my back, and then another 75 to 85 pounds worth of gear in my hands. And that 15 feet or so from the dive bench to the edge of the boat is quite a, um, as you would imagine, is quite a struggle. Um, once the dive master or the dive supervisor in charge says those three things that I love to hear, dive, 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 and we jump off the back of the boat, the system then becomes quite manageable. I've trimmed it out to be very neutral, and I could spin it on my finger underwater. One of the things that we have been fortunate enough to, to be able to be a part of is capturing the wealth of maritime resources that we have off our coast. North Carolina is, is known as the graveyard of the Atlantic, and it's known that, that um, for a good reason. There are conservative estimates put it to two to 3,000 shipwrecks off our coast. Much more aggressive estimates put it upwards of eight or 8,000 or more shipwrecks off the coast. Everything from right there on the beach that you can visit um, on low tide to some of the sites that you're gonna see today are as deep as 260 feet and below. Um, we do mixed gas rebreather diving. We are, our scientific dive team at CSI and at ECU um, have been trained up to do what we call technical diving to some of these extreme depths. And, and the image that you see on the bottom of the screen on the left there uh, of me with uh, off the bow uh, capturing, this is actually the Diamond Shoals light ship, which is a World War I shipwreck off the coast. Um, uh, that's at about 200 feet, and you see all the gear that I have to bring with me. So in addition to the rebreather that's on my back, I have two redundant um, 80 cubic cylinder, 80 cubic foot cylinders underneath each arm. And again, it's really a bear, but once you get underwater, it's, um, it's really sort of a pleasure to dive with. And so we've been really fortunate to be able to work on a lot of projects um, related to shipwrecks off the coast of North Carolina. And until recently, until just a few years ago, we actually had a maritime archeologist, Dr. Nathan Richards, on faculty with us. Um, he had an opportunity to run the program in maritime studies at ECU. He was a faculty within that department and was placed out um, at the Coastal Studies Institute. He is now the director of that program at ECU. He's back in Greenville, but we still partner with him quite regularly. Um, in addition to um, our partners at ECU and the Program in Maritime Studies, we do hope to hire a, 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 an additional faculty member, an additional maritime archaeologist in the future. Um, but we work really closely also with our federal partners, NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary and NOAA's Maritime Heritage Program have been really active partners with us on documenting um, shipwrecks off the coast. And one of the major um, 
sort of thematic areas that we've been documenting since 2008, and I've been a part of it since the very beginning, is the Battle of the Atlantic. And the Battle of the Atlantic, for those of you who don't know, is that time in World War II, in the first six months off of, uh, of 1942, off the coast of, uh, off the eastern seaboard, Hitler's German U-boats sunk close to 500 merchant vessels off the coast. The area off Cape Hatteras was a, a prime target. The topography of the, of the landscape that's there, the bathymetry, the way that the shipping lanes travel up and down that coast, meant that most of those merchant vessels off the eastern seaboard had to come relatively close to Cape Hatteras. And because of that, those German U-boats targeted them. It was called Torpedo Junction. And for those first six months, it was really like shooting fish in a barrel. And we lost, as I mentioned, close to 500 ships off the eastern seaboard, close to 65, 70 um, off of North Carolina alone. And and since 2008, uh, CSI and ECU and our partners at NOAA have documented close to 60 of those World War II shipwrecks off the coast of North Carolina. We document those in a variety of different ways. One is photography and videography. We also use advanced remote sensing techniques like side scan sonar and multi-beam sonar. Um, we do photo mosaics and a more recent technology um, that has become easier to do we do photogrammetry, where we capture them in three dimensions. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and I'm going to show you how we do that process as well. And so the images that you see up on the screen right now are me on some of those shipwrecks. So let's go through some of them. One of the things that I love about shipwreck diving is that sense of exploration. Even though we can learn from the history of that shipwreck, from the, the records that are there, and we can um, use remote sensing to be able to get an overall view of what that site might look like. When you're there, it's really that sense of discovery. And documenting it is, um, is really a joy for me. So this is my dive buddy, um, David Seibert, on this particular dive, who's exploring the um, prop of the Manuela, which was a merchant vessel that was lost in 1942. This is... Um, uh, this particular one is a, in about 150 feet of water um, near the shoals off of Cape Hatteras. Usually has pretty clear water conditions and um, has some major features that are of note, including this prop. Um, as a photographer, I'm looking to document for science, um, document the entire shipwreck. And then as a photographer from the artistic side, I'm looking for interesting compositions that allow me to lead the viewer's eyes through the, through the image itself. And in this particular one, you really get the feel that, that Dave's exploring the, um, the prop in this one. By far, my favorite shipwreck in all of North Carolina is this one. It is one of the most difficult ones to dive. It is um, one of the most pristine of all the World War II shipwrecks. And, uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's one of the deeper ones. This is the E.M. Clark. The E.M. Clark was a, um, a merchant vessel, an oil tanker, um, that was sunk by the U-124 in March of 1942. She was carrying oil north to New Jersey when she was struck by a torpedo on her port side, and she sunk um, in the waters off of Diamond Shoals. She lays to rest um, on her port side, and she's quite large. And so just to give you an idea of how big she is, that's Russ Green, with the video camera that you see in the image. And he's no small guy. He's about 6'5 and 250 pounds. So you can see, based on the size of, of, uh, of Russ there, it's a big shipwreck. She's 500 feet long. She has a 70-foot beam. Um, the sand, it's about 260, 250 feet to the sand. And to the top of her, um, her starboard beam up there, it's, a, it's about just right around 200 feet, so there's quite a bit of relief. It's in open blue water, usually with a screaming, ripping current. Luckily, that goes mostly bow to stern, and so when we dive this wreck, it's usually what we call live boating, where the, uh, the captain of the boat will judge the current, put us up current. In some cases, diving this wreck, we've had to drop upwards of a half a mile up current of the wreck, and 
when that di captain in dive soup says dive, 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 we all jump off the back of the boat, sink as quickly as we can, and hope, uh, and hope that we're going to hit that wreck. Because if you don't hit that wreck, what do you think we see a lot of? A lot of water, a lot of sand. We still have to do the decompression dives on the way up. I've done, we call them sand dives. I've done my fair share of 200, 200 foot plus sand dives. And you're only doing one of those in a day. Um, this level of diving when you go below 130 feet becomes um, decompression diving. We can't come straight up. You risk illness, potentially paralysis or even death. And so we have a stage decompression on the way back up. To give you an idea, if we did a, a 20 minute bottom time at the, on this particular wreck, we may have 90 minutes or more of decompression depending on what profile that we do to be able to come back up. So if we do that sand dive, I still have to do that, um, that decompression and that dive is shot for the day. So it, it's, a big, um, it's a big risk. But in, 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 um, in the case of the EM Clark, I think it's worth it. It is spectacular. If you imagine in your head, at least for me, what a shipwreck looks like, it's the EM Clark. It's, it's large, it's pronounced, it's still all intact. It's anchors, you can see it's, it's um, uh, starboard side anchor is sitting upright on the top of the, of the bow there. It's really quite impressive wreck. Um, the last time I dove this wreck, we drifted down the entire length of the wreck itself. When you get to the other side, you end up at the fantail, which is just as impressive. And you can see on the screen here, here you can see my three dive buddies there with the large fantail that's exposed at the end um, of the dive there. This is right before we're beginning to make our descent. On our ascent, what we do is we actually shoot what's called a lift bag. It's basically an uh, inflatable bag that we blow up at the, uh, while we're at the seafloor. We shoot it to the surface on what's called a line reel. And then that lift bag bobs on the surface and lets the surface team and the captain know where we are as we drift off site. If our entire team is together, we'll shoot another lift bag up that line uh, those two lift bags together indicate to the topside team that um, we're all together and coming up the line. We also use a color-coded system to come up. We use yellow bags, which means everything's going to be okay. And if a red bag comes to the surface, that means we have potentially a problem and be prepared for a situation. Um, luckily, we've never had to do that. Um, one of the things that shipwrecks, I think, evoke for me is, is mystery and intrigue. Um, many times off of Cape Hatteras, we get super clear conditions, 150 foot plus visibility, beautiful conditions, but many times we do not. And I've had 150 to 200 foot dives where it's near zero visibility and we're spending our time down there and I'm not taking a single image because there's nothing to see. And other times it's sort of that in between time. And I really like this image of the diver over the engine block of the Atlas. The Atlas is another World War II shipwreck. It's located a little further south than the EM Clark. She's very what we call disarticulated. So she um, is in shallower water. She's, I believe she's about 110 to 120 feet deep. Um, and these shallower sites were oftentimes wire dragged by the military or dynamited to be able to then break them apart um, to make them not be hazards to navigation and also not be an opportunity for, um, uh, for other U-boats to then hide next to. So that's one of the things that the EM Clark, none of that happened to the EM Clark for a couple of reasons. One, it was a relatively deep site, so it was much more difficult for them to do. And two, it also um, uh, didn't pose as near as much of a risk in terms of a hazard to navigation because of its depth. Um, not every image has to be, uh, again, we talked about mystery. This one is of the Australia. This is a relatively shallow site, actually located right on the shoals. It's at around 70 feet. And in this particular dive, we had a ripping current. And I don't know if you can tell by Joe Hoyt's, Joe Hoyt is the silhouette that you see on the left here. He looks exhausted, doesn't he? <laughs> on this particular dive, we, um, we had a screaming current that was almost undiveable, and that happens on some of these, especially on, on, the, um, on, uh, on Diamond Shoals. And it was everything for us to make the site. I quickly 
ducked into the shipwreck here to turn around and take this photo while everybody sort of caught their breath before we continued on to, um, uh, to explore the wreck. And I, I really just kind of, seeing Joe's posture in this one makes me chuckle a little bit, but also just gives you a, a view into, you know, how difficult it is to get on some of these sites at some points. Um, not a lot of detail on this site, but there's, to me, there's, there's something behind this. Um, we're traveling now. We don't just cover sites in North Carolina. I've traveled all over the world with, um, with folks from the program of Maritime Studies and our partners from NOAA. Um, here we are down in the uh, waters off of Isla Mirada, Florida, in the Florida Keys. This is um, another one of my favorite shipwrecks, and it's called the Queen of Nassau. And the Queen of Nassau was originally a Canadian um, patrol vessel used in World War II, um, and also used um, prior to World War II, and then it was actually decommissioned and became a, um, a, a commercial fishing vessel before it sunk in the 60s, I believe it sunk. Um, this particular site is, is a deeper site. It's about 235 feet, and it is shrouded in fishing nets. And so you can't tell from this particular image, but as you travel down, it's completely covered in fishing nets, and it really almost looks like it's emerging from this shell of, of nets. One of the things I like about this image is the bow of the Queen of Nassau is this knife bow. It's a very sharp leading line. And so in this image, we're actually getting ready. You can see one of the divers with the yellow bag there. We're getting ready to shoot our bag to the surface. And I pulled off from the bow um, to get a bow shot before we went away. And, um, and you can really see that knife edge. An interesting thing about this site, I've dove this site three separate times. And two of those times, we've seen a 15-foot sawfish, short-tooth sawfish, in the sand right off the stern of this particular, which is a very rare fish to see that we photographed. Uh, not all images of shipwrecks are um, uh, drab and dreary. They can also be, be encrusted with incredible amounts of marine life. Um, and not all shipwrecks are, um, are accidents. This is, we're down in Key Largo. This is actually, we go down to the Keys many times to do training dives. Um, they call it the graveyard of the Atlantic because it's very rough. And so on an average project, we might schedule 15 to 20 dive days. We'll be lucky if we get a quarter to a half of those dive days. More often than not, we're blown out because the conditions are too rough for us to dive. It's not the actual diving, it's getting on and off the boat with hundreds of pounds of gear strapped to your back and cameras that cost as much as um, small houses in Winnebago's that you don't want to lose. Um, but this image, my dive buddy, I think this is Jason Nunn. I, I oftentimes give my divers lights even if they don't need them because I, I like divers with lights and photographs. It gives off that feeling of exploration and um, is, a, is an interest point. And so this is a crane uh, structure that's on the Spiegel Grove, which is actually an artificial reef in, in Key Largo. This one was sunk on purpose and is a major economic driver for, um, for Key Largo and for the dive industry. Key Largo touts itself as the dive capital of the U.S., if not the world, and they certainly um, pack them in there, and this is a great site for any diver. You can get deeper dives as deep as 130, 140 feet. The top of the wreck is 60 feet. Um, you can spend literally weeks exploring this thing inside and out with proper training, of course. Um, we not only dive in really warm waters. Um, I did a project in 2019 in um, Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands um, where we dove on World War II planes and you saw in Key Largo and Isla Mirada and typically in North Carolina is warm during the summer months, but we also do cold water diving as well on shipwrecks. This image is um, taken in Lake um, Huron, and this is at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We work really closely up there with Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and this is the E.B. Allen. The E.B. Allen um, is a, an all-wooden shipwreck. Mo many of the ships sunk in Thunder Bay were results of collisions in that particular area. And if you like shipwrecks, Thunder Bay um, and the Great Lakes is the place to go. And in the spring, you can get Caribbean clear water. 
Now, the one downside to diving in the spring, uh, when I say spring, I'm talking late April, early May, in upper Michigan, what do you think it is? Cold water. So in this particular dive, um, the water was a balmy 36 degrees. Um, and we were doing, this is a shallow dive. This is about 100, 110 feet. The E.B. Allen was sunk in the, um, I don't, don't want to misspeak, but I, I think it's an 1800 shipwreck. It's an all wooden construction. And that's one of the interesting things. The, the Great Lakes, because of the, the, the coastal or the processes that are there and the fact that they don't have near the same dynamic environment that we have off the coast of North Carolina, wooden shipwrecks are still very well preserved. And so this particular one, even though it went down in the 1800s, is still very well preserved and really sort of a joy to visit. We did dives here for several years, technical dives um, down into the couple hundred foot range to visit a variety of sites, ships sunk all the way in the late 1700s, all the way up to more modern shipwrecks um, that were sunk in the 60s and, and there beyond. Lake Huron and uh, the waters of those not northern Michigan area is one of my favorite areas to dive. The water was a little warmer. I might want to go there more often. Um, but our partners at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary are a joy to work with. We actually did a live broadcast, believe it or not, from underwater to a group of students into the World Wide Web um, from 70 feet down on the Montana. We broadcast it live from underwater and actually did a, a back and forth uh, with that as well. Sometimes we have to search for shipwrecks. And in fact, um, uh, one shipwreck in particular that we were looking for for a long time was uh, a German U-boat off the coast. Until 2014, we knew the location of only three of, I believe, to be four German U-boats sunk off the coast of North Carolina. Um, the three that were relatively well known are the U-85, which is just 15 miles off the coast of Nags Head, the U-701, um, which until the, this particular one was my favorite of the three, which is located about 46 miles southeast of Oregon Inlet or about oh, 25, 30 miles off of, um, off of Avon. And then the 352, which is about 36 miles or so, give or take, off of Moorhead City. There was a, a fourth that was known to have been sunk, the U-576. And this particular one was sunk in July. We just recently passed its anniversary of its sinking in July of 1942. And this is a, was a really important sinking for the Allies, because until up until about July, we really kind of didn't have our act together. And the, um, the Germans would basically pick off these merchant vessels with really very little um, resistance. And by about this time, um, the Allies got together and said, hey, don't you think maybe we should move in convoys and maybe have some military protection? And so this convoy left from Norfolk called the KS-520 Convoy. And K stood for their, where they were headed for, which is Key, Key West. S stood for the direction they were headed south, and 520 was their convoy designation. And within this convoy was several um, merchant vessels, the Iroquois, the Mowinkle, the Chalor, um, and the Blue Fields, and a couple others. And they had some aerial support that w had flown in from, uh, from Cherry Point. And uh, they had uh, outfitted at least one of the ships, the Iroquois, with a 50 caliber machine gun located on the deck. Um, this convoy was headed south, and by early July, it reached the waters off of Cape Hatteras. And a particular U-boat captain of the 576 was um, laying in wait off these waters. He, he um, came upon the convoy and got greedy. And he tracked the convoy, came up with his periscope, attack periscope, sort of right in the middle almost in the convoy, went right up into the, uh, into the pack itself and thought, I'm going to get um, a lot of tonnage from these kills. And these, these German U-boats were formidable both underwater and at the surface. Underwater, um, they operated under battery power and could do six to seven knots. They had four forward torpedoes and one aft torpedo. And on the, the deck, once they were on, on, uh, up above the water, they could operate as a diesel vessel. And they had a, a um, 88 millimeter or three inch deck gun that could easily blow holes in the sides of a ship. And a, um, 
and a 22 millimeter anti-aircraft gun that was located on what's called the Vinter Garden. Think of it as a little porch on the back of the conning tower. So they were really formidable um, weapons of war. And this particular U-boat captain let, got in the middle of the convoy and let a full bow salvo of torpedoes go, immediately striking the blue fields, a Nicaraguan tanker heading south. And it went down. All 46 men made it off. Um, he injured the Chalor and the Morwinkle, which were then dead in the water. The Uruquois, it's believed to be, tried to come about, but you know what they say about turning a ship, it takes a long time, right? And attempted to ram it and fire its 50 cal. But the real heroes were the aerial support from Cherry Point, the depth charge this, um, this from above, where it sank to the seafloor and wasn't seen again until, um, until much later, obviously, which is leading to where we are here. And so starting in 2009, um, the Coastal Studies Institute, in close partnership with ECU's Program in Maritime Studies and NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, set out to find the 576. And we used a variety of different remote sensing techniques using side scan, uh, multi-beam sonar, magnetometry, and we surveyed almost 300 square miles of seafloor off the coast of North Carolina. We then would find targets and go back with higher resolution remote sensing. And in 2014, we went back to visit seven targets that we had identified. And we use this device that you see in the upper right hand corner there, that's called an AUV. Think of it as an underwater robot, an underwater drone, if you will, that you can put a payload on. In this particular case, we put a payload of a multi-beam sonar, which basically uses sonar in a variety of frequencies to create a three-dimensional point cloud a representation of what's down there. This is a device that is not cheap. It's a couple million dollar device and it was quite expensive to rent and, and it was riddled with issues. It would leak and it, we had all these problems and halfway through the expedition, the batteries failed. The team said, well, it's failed. It's coming back to the surface. I think it's flooded. We get it to the surface. We pull it on board, which is what you see the aerial imagery is shot from my drone there of pulling the, it on board downloaded the footage from that last pass, and right before it died, the image that you see on the bottom is what it brought back. So sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, and this was a perfect example of that. There's no doubt that that's a German U-boat, right? But there's a problem. This particular German U-boat, which we, without a doubt, know is the 576, and we were able to have, it's not near as sexy an image, but have a multi-beam and side scan image of the blue fields just 200 meters away, 600 feet. It's sitting at anywhere between 730 and 800 feet of water. Now I'm a mixed gas rebreather diver, which is basically a really complicated way to say I can go pretty deep, but I can't, it's not bottomless. So we tap out at about 300 feet. Much past that, I can go to that depth, but the ability for me to come back and see my family and kids be able to walk and breathe is very limited, and my life is much more important than this data, so we had to find alternative ways to do that. Which brings me to this little device, which I love diving, but if we could have a couple of these in full-time text, these are mini submarines that, are, um, uh, that allow you to dive to a depth of about 1,000 feet at one atmosphere. Um, and we partnered with a group called um, uh, Project Baseline, uh, run by a gentleman named Robert Carmichael, who has two of these mini submarines. And these mini submarines um, allowed us to put a whole bunch of equipment on these and then go, back, go down and bring back the first images of these. So it took us a while to put this project together. We discovered the 576 in 2014. It wasn't tw until 2016 that we were, were able to secure the funds through some grant funds and some uh, partnerships with uh, project baseline, the deal was they wanted all the imagery and video that I shot for their own purposes. We said no problem. Uh, in fact, there's a, a special that's on the History Channel that's made with all the footage that we, that we shot there. Um, and so that little guy inside that mini submarine, that's me, getting ready to prepare for our first dive. And there was two mini submarines. So the first dive was myself, my mini sub, I outfitted with all sorts of different cameras cameras both inside the housing as well as cameras outside that I could robotically control. The other housing, the other um, 
The other U-boat was outfitted with a variety of remote sensing gear, including multi-beam um, sonar and 3D laser scanners. And we 3D laser scanned. We work with uh, a group that does that for the oil and gas industry. We were able to create models that are um, accurate, give or take um, a few millimeters. That's how accurate these are. And we were able to go down and bring back the first images of this um, of this German U-boat. This is a frame, frame grab from some of the video that we shot. If you visit our website, you can find the 576 and footage of that particular one. Joe is actually lighting up the 576 um, from his vessel, and I'm lighting it up uh, from the front there, and we sort of worked in tandem for that first dive. Any of you guys that remember the summer of 2016? It was the summer of the tropical depression and hurricane. We had three tropical de depressions all in a row. And, um, and that was all during our 15-day expedition. So we had planned to get, I had planned to get nine dives on the sub. I had one. Um, we had a couple other folks go down. We're able to get some other work done. We were able to bring back uh, quite a bit of footage. Um, I would encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. I would love to show it to you here. Maybe some of the, those of you that are in the room after the program's over, if you're interested, I can show it to you here as well. Um, but uh, we, we weren't able to, to go back out because of the sea condition. Um, I mentioned ways that we document shipwrecks, photography and videography. Um, we also do something called photo mosaic. The, uh, the image that you see at the top of the screen there is the U-85. This is the U-boat that's located just 15 miles off the coast of, Na of Nags Head. Well, maybe 17 miles, give or take, off the coast of Nags Head. This particular photo mosaic, um, I made with Joe Hoyt, uh, archaeologist at NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. This was made in 2008. 2008 was a different time in terms of technology. These fancy little cell phones that we all have in our pockets were not near as rampant. The iPhone had only been out for a little bit of time. And photo mosaics were a big deal. And so this was a photo mosaic that we made in 2008, made from about 50 photos that we took going down the side of the wreck. And at that time, this was quote, the bee's knees as far as documentation goes. Now everyone with an iPhone can do a photo mosaic at the touch of a button. So we had to sort of up our game a little bit. And so we started to um, learn the process of photogrammetry. And photogrammetry is the use of photographs to make measurements. It's sort of a mixture of, I think it's a mixture of art and science. And so I'm going to run through that process of how it works. And so the image that you see down in the lower right, my dive buddy took a photograph of me. That's me actually going around and photographing the U85. I made this model in 2014. And in this particular case, on the left, you see all the little thumbnails. Those are all my photographs. So in this particular wreck, I think I took 850 to 900 photographs. And you'll notice that each one of those blue rectangles overlap. You want 50% or more overlap in every one of your photographs. And what the computer then goes in and does is it looks for tie points, common areas, between each one of those photographs and assigns those tie points, both a luminance value, a brightness, and an RGB value, a color. And so you'll notice below my, my squares, there's a whole bunch of little dots. And if you look at that, it doesn't really look like a shipwreck. But if you take those tie points and then use those for the computer to find additional time points, right? This is what that looks like if I take that, um, take those blue squares away. This is sort of a loose representation. It sort of looks like a U-boat, but not certainly anything you'd want to make any measurements off of. But if you take this and use those tie points to then find additional tie points, you can then take the, let's say, 30,000 or so dots that I have here and turn them into about 275 million dots. Now, if you look at this, this looks like a photograph, right? And I can spin it in 360. But if I zoom in really close on this, it's just a bunch of dots. And what do you have to do? Let's go back to our youth. What do you do with a bunch of dots? You connect them all, right? So that next step is to take and do a really complex dot to dot. And so what you see right here is a zoom in of one of the torpedo tubes. The U85, the shell of the, the outer shell, is stripped away and only the pressure vessel is what's exposed. And so in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the wire mesh. And I've zoomed in on one of the torpedo tubes so you can see the vertices. And so there's about 47 million little vertices 
that are then created from that dot to dot, or excuse me, polygons that are created from that dot to dot. Then I can take that and then take a photo mosaic that not only has X and Y value, like your regular photo mosaic, but has X and Y and then enter the third axis, Z, right, depth, and you lay that over it. Then you have the ability to spin it in three dimensions, see it from any, many different angles, and if you go down while you're taking the photo mosaic, or that photogrammetry down underwater, you can, if you take several measurements, then you can calibrate your model and actually make accurate measurements off the model you create. You can see it from different viewpoints, you can do calculations of volume, how much sand is there, and the true value of this is not doing it once, but doing it over time. And that allows you to track change and see how sites change and evolve um, and, and allows you to do that over time. So this is sort of the current state of, this is new to our tool bag of shipwreck documentation, new as of seven or eight years ago. And we've, we've refined it even more to this point where we'll work in multi-person teams documenting some of the bigger sites. And so to give you an idea, in 2008, we did a site plan, a hand-drawn site plan that took archaeologists five days of diving. I think it was five. Might have only been four. Um, I did the photo mosaic of you know, one 45-minute dive underwater and maybe about seven or eight hours of computer time after that. So if you think about the ability to capture these things within the archaeological record, um, it really has sped that up and is really a, a valuable tool for archaeologists. Now, shipwrecks not only are wonderful cultural resources, they are also amazing natural resources and attract a wide variety of marine life. And one of the things, if you're a diver, one of the reasons you dive on North Carolina shipwrecks are for these little toothy critters that you see at the top there. Those are sand tiger sharks. And sand tiger sharks are ubiquitous to North Carolina. They are sort of the icon of... Um, of North Carolina shipwrecks. They get big, they get 10, 12 feet long, um, three, 400 pounds, but I really call them big old puppy dogs because they are, more often than not, they are swimming away from you while you're trying to get closer to them. Um, if you like to photograph sand tiger sharks, North Carolina is the place to go. In fact, we have a partnership with um, the North Carolina Aquariums on a project called Spot a Shark. And Spot a Shark is a program that uses the unique pattern on the sides of sand tiger sharks. Sand tiger sharks have a spot pattern on their sides. You can see here, this, is, this particular photograph was taken on the Dixie Arrow, which is a really fantastic shipwreck, World War II shipwreck. This is the top of the engine block. It's located about 17 miles off of Ocracoke. It's a very easy, benign dive. It's about 95 feet to the sand. The top of this engine block is about 60 feet. It's usually very calm. It's like a giant aquarium. You can see Goliath grouper there. There's always huge sand tigers, moray eels. It's really a fantastic site to visit. But these sand tigers along their sides have a series of spots. And those spots are very much like your thumbprint. Each one is unique. And so the aquarium, with a partnership with a group called WildMe, has developed a computer program um, with this WildMe software that allows them to use those spots to identify individual sand tiger sharks. And if you go to Spot a Shark USA um, on the web, um, spotasharkusa.com, you can actually upload your photographs of sand tiger sharks. There's thousands of them now, and we're finding matches to better understand how these sand tiger sharks use shipwrecks off the coast of North Carolina. Here's this giant charismatic megavertebrate, the sand tiger shark, that we really know little about its movements, its migrations, where it has its pups, how it uses shipwrecks, does it return to those shipwrecks, where does it go during certain times of the year, and so we partner with them um, to do several things. One, help photograph and promote this project, as well as use a tagging program that allows them to use um, acoustic tags to be able to track them. We've put acoustic tags at several sites, along with our partners at NOAA, uh, excuse me, our partners at, uh, at the aquarium. This particular um, shipwreck is called the Proteus, uh, which is located um, about 25 miles off of Cape Hatteras. It is a particularly sharky dive. It's about 125 feet. This is a large female. And this is uh, a couple summers ago. Um, the male is quite frisky with the female. And you'll notice all the bite marks on her pectoral fin. 
um, the male will actually grab on, hold on to those forward pectoral fins during mating. It's quite aggressive behavior um, in, that, in that process. You'll notice in all of these sand tiger sharks that the photographs, this is another photograph, this was actually taken at the Dixie Arrow of another sand tiger shark. You'll notice that in all of these, the sand tiger um, looks like it's quartering towards me. In underwater photography, there's really only a few focal lengths that are very useful. One of the problems with water is even in the clearest conditions, if you get much more than a few feet away from something, the clarity of the water affects the um, clarity of your image. So the predominant theory in underwater photography is use the widest lens you can get and get as close to the thing you're photographing as you can. Even those shipwreck photographs that I showed you earlier that show that entire expanse of shipwreck, I'm usually less than five feet away from that shipwreck, but I'm using an ultra-wide lens that allows me to capture everything. If I was to use a standard lens of like, say, 35 or 50 millimeter, it would seem very hazy, it wouldn't be clear at all. So I'm getting as close as I possibly can. So in this case, with this particular lens, um, I think this is about 15 millimeters, could be slightly wider. But to get a sh shot that fills the frame, I'm about a half a foot to a foot away from these guys to be able to fill the frame. I teach an underwater photography course for um, the scientific dive program at ECU, and it's a multi-day course sometimes that we'll do, and we'll do these dives with, uh, on, with sand tigers, and folks will come up and say, I say, how'd it go? And they say, oh, it's great, I got all these great photographs of sand tiger sharks, I can't wait to see them, and then we'll have our critiques at night. And here you've got this giant frame, and the sand tiger is a little pea in the frame. You have to get as, cl as close as you possibly can, and so that's why I say I'm not chasing these sharks, but what I do to get images like this is I look at their vector, the direction that they're heading, and I try to place myself so that I will intercept them at some point. And usually this photograph is right before they turn to hit my camera dome. Um, that's how you get that shot. Which, here's a good example of that. North Carolina shipwrecks um, are magnets for bait fish. And sometimes Spanish sardines or um, tom tates, um, these are Spanish sardines, I think, in this particular image that's here, they can be so thick it clouds the sun. And it's, it's disorienting. You can't tell what direction's in, up. You can't hardly see anything. You're hoping, you're watching your depth gauge to make sure you're not going up or down. And in this case, coming out of all of this were sand tiger sharks heading left and right. And so I'm trying to intercept them which made for a, a really interesting shot. This is actually on the NACO, which is one of my favorite shipwrecks, 130 feet deep, another World War II shipwreck located south of Diamond Shoals. Hey, John, I'm, I'm wondering if we can do a little Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, uh, and this is, a good, uh, this is a good image maybe to start for the, uh, a question that I had. Uh, feel free to share more images as we go. And so I wanted to invite everyone who's here to ask questions. And uh, if you are online, you can ask questions on the Facebook chat next to this, uh, uh, this live feed. Um, but the question I was going to ask was about color. Uh, and you just happened to land on this. Uh, I noticed, that, you know, in a lot of these photos, you're stuck with blue. You know, that's it. that's that's just the predominant color that you're working with. But I noticed on the Dixie Arrow, in the photo from um, uh, Key Largo, uh, and this one, that there's a lot of vibrant color if you look in the right places. Um, is color in this instance? And this might be a question more for a biologist, but is there some sort of um, uh, Darwinian reason why? Uh, uh, you know, these colors appear even at great depths. It, it seems like that when you take the lights down there, um, it's probably very dark to our eyes, but when you light it up, it just becomes this vibrant series of colors. Yeah, and one of the things that you'll notice, um, well, I talked about the properties of water and the fact that it's, it's dense and it eats up light very quickly. And so at those shallower depths, why you could see it on the Dixie Arrow, because we had sunlight penetrating quite rapidly to that depth. Those other areas have those wider shots of shipwrecks. They're blue because I'm shooting them from further away. My lights are only effective five feet, maybe seven feet away from me, and I have really powerful lights. So all of these things have color on them. It's just the ability to, for me to bring that color out using lights. And in this particular case, 
I'm shooting a live bottom. So North Carolina doesn't have coral reefs, but we do have live bottoms. These are hardened structures that are much like the coral reefs of Key Largo. And you're right, there's a lot of color on these, the purple gorgonians, the, the orange sponges that you see there. In terms of reason for that color, a lot of that is adaptation, right? So adapting to, sometimes coloration can be advertising, sometimes it can be warning, sometimes it can be camouflage. I don't wanna presuppose as to why these might be that particular color, but they've adapted and evolved for those colors for a particular reason. And North Carolina live bottoms, these hard bottoms off North Carolina are really unique. So these are the only natural structures that are off the coast of North Carolina that can attract encrusting marine organisms besides shipwrecks. And so this live bottom photo that you see here um, shows how diverse they are. And I love, it's a, these are shelves that are not enormous reefs like you see in Key Largo, but they're four or five feet. And they provide just enough relief for a wide variety of marine life. So here we can see grouper located underneath this. Some of the biggest lobsters I've ever seen, 15, 20 pounders, are located in these. These are Florida spiny lobsters, are located in these. This particular site is called the 210 Rock, which I think if I gave these numbers out, there's some people who would kill me. Um, but it, it's really spectacular. This image is also North Carolina. This looks like something that you would see in the Keys, but this is North Carolina live bottoms. And scientists study these, and so here you can see um, our, uh, a biologist, Avery Paxton, from IMS and works with NOAA, who's actually studying these live bottoms off in North Carolina. Some of them are flat with not lots of relief, like you see here, and others have several feet of relief that provide lots of interstitial space, which is basically a fancy word for nooks and crannies for, um, for marine life to attach to. And in fact, you can see she uses uh, photography for her studies. The device that you see in her hand is a camera with a quadrat that allows her to take a, every time she takes a photograph, she's photographing the same amount of space. And so she can look at diversity on areas. And, and the diversity in these just small areas of these live bottoms are crazy beautiful. This is an anemone um, that's located on the edge of one of those live bottom uh, ledges, and there are no less than, it's probably hard to see, but six arrow crabs that are actually within that, um, within that anemone. And if you look around it, there's probably seven or eight species of algae, encrusting corals, gorgonians, um, countless number of benthic critters that call these places their home. That attracts, obviously, smaller fish, which attracts larger fish, which supports larger game fish that are important, like grouper snapper, and attract sharks and those kind of things. So I'm sort of skirting around your question of, of in terms of color, but there, these are oases in a veritable desert of sand that's out there. I think you adaptation pretty much uh, covered my question, but I did want to call attention to the, the color because it is seen, especially at the, the deeper depths that you're, you're in, in the midst of this expanse of vast blue um, I want to open it up to questions for anybody who's here. Um, if you've got a question, why don't you just go, uh, go ahead and ask it directly to John, and I may repeat it so the folks who are watching the video can hear your question. Fascinating um, information, very technical, but uh, a little bit about how you got your start in diving, uh, and that led you to this room tonight with uh, this material. So... Uh, <laughs> It's a rather circuitous way to get there. Um, I was a, um, as a youth, as a teenager, like many teenagers, I was uh, a little rambunctious, maybe is the right word to put it, um, adventurous, uh, sought out trouble. Um, and my parents said, hey, what do you think about diving? Maybe you should take up a hobby like diving. Maybe and so at 16, I got dive certified and fell in love with it. But unfortunately, I didn't have the funds to be able to do it very often, and I sort of languished after the first years, which is the typical, most divers, what they do is they get, they get their first certified right before their big vacation to the Keys, right? Or to someplace beautiful. <laughs> they get certified, they go on their trip, they go dive, they have a great time, they go back, they spend all this money on gear, they probably should have rented, 
They spend all this money on gear, and then the gear sits in their closet for years and years and years. And then when they want to go pick it up again, then they're nervous because they haven't done it in forever. Their gear is out of spec. And that same thing happened to me. So I first got the dive bug when I was 16, which um, this dates me a little bit, but that was in the 80s. And it wasn't until I started to work for the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, that I started to really dive again. I dove a little at uh, Fort Fisher uh, right out of college. Um, but in, in 1996, 97, when I started at the aquarium there in Long Beach, we collected a lot of the animals for our exhibits. We also had really big exhibits. We had half a million gallon exhibits that were basically giant dive experiences. We had calm mass that we could actually do live dive programs, much like what they do here at the aquarium here. And, um, and so I started to really get into it there. And I've always had a passion for photography. Um, and so I, I tried to mix those two. And I will never forget, and I think it was 98 or 99, we got our first um, digital SLR at the aquarium. It was $10,000. It was a Canon 1D. And it was two megapixels. And it was the, in today's terms, it was the worst camera ever. Um, but the fact that it could take an image, I wasn't limited to 36 exposures, because before that I used the Nikonos 35 millimeter underwater. I only had 36 photos, so I had to really want to take that photo, and I didn't know what I got until I developed it later. Um, and the fact that I could take hundreds of photos and see it on this two inch tiny little screen, but to me it was amazing at the time. Um, that, that, was a, that was a game changer for me back then. So then flash forward to moving here, and um, I was diving more in the real ocean, less in aquariums, and there for collecting, we would dive a lot at Catalina. Um, and a lot of the diving in North Carolina is technical. A lot of it is deep. There is, uh, one of the things I'll say about North Carolina, it is one of the greatest dive destinations in the, well, in my experience, I haven't dove everywhere around the world. It's one of the greatest dive, it can be one of the greatest dive destinations, but it's not, it's not new diver friendly. Most of the really great sites are deeper. And so that led me down the technical diving path, which is hundreds of hours of training, um, lots of different certifications. Uh, I have just about, besides cave diving, I have, there's no more certifications I can get in terms of other. And so in 2013, we transitioned from what we call open circuit diving, which is what you think of the typical scuba. You've got a tank on your back that you're breathing in compressed air and then your excellent is going out into the atmosphere. And we switch to what's called rebreather diving. And what that does is it's a closed loop system. In fact, I'll go back to a photograph here. Let's see, here you can see the, the back of the system in the lower left hand. It's a closed loop system in which there is a I'm, it's sort of gross if you think about it because you're rebreathing the same breath over and over again. But in this, in this vessel on your back is a, is a canister that has something called softenalime in it and actually scrubs out the CO2 from your breath, right? Because if that CO2 built up, eventually you would pass out, regulator would fall out of your mouth, and you'd drown. Which we don't want that to happen. So it scrubs out the CO2, and then there's three oxygen sensors that are inside the system that measure the amount of oxygen and then inject oxygen from that green tank that you see there to whatever blend I tell it to. It's kind of like having a custom gas blender on my back at all given times. And since 2013, we've really, I wouldn't say exclusively dive that, but we dive it as much as we possibly can. It makes the deep diving theoretically safer. It makes the shallow diving um, unnecessarily complex, to be honest with you. But we've made that commitment because um, those rebreathers are something, and as a photographer, it's bubbleless. So if I'm wanting to get close to fish, if you're on, if you're on open circuit and you've got bubbles coming out, when you move into a school of fish, all the bubbles go away, all the fish go away. If I'm on a rebreather and I move into a school of fish, they part around me, and then they're like, oh, you're one of us, and they kind of come back down around you. So it allows me to get closer to marine life um, with, with that as well. So it's, you know, this is 25 plus years of training to get to the point that I'm at now. It's not something that's, that we take lightly and we are, we are what we can call conservative risk takers. We have 
multiple redundant systems to ensure our safety. We don't run any of the decompression algorithms anywhere close to what's called their M value, which is what the Navy uses. I'm not a Navy SEAL um, or anywhere close to in shape as the Navy SEALs. So we do what's called a gradient factor of that. We do a percentage of that as a, as a safety. Yeah. A few years ago, I took a, a course with Nathan on underwater surveying and, and you know, with manual tapes and stuff. It sounds like what you're describing, that, that's no longer done. Uh, it's all photography and other technology. So the question was that, um, uh, that and I, I remember you from the course now that you took your mask off, that you took a Nautical Archaeological Society, which is a UK training regime, to train um, advocate divers to learn how to record shipwrecks underwater. And the question was, is that, is that old hat, right? Is that now obsolete? And the answer is no. Um, so the archaeologists, they are, as they probably should be, right? They hold on to tradition, and they um, have tried and tested uh, techniques that they utilize, but they embrace new technology. Now, some sites are not well suited to doing traditional um, quadrat, where we run a baseline, we break it up into sections, and you work for um, long periods of time. If we're on a 200-foot deep shipwreck, you're not doing that. So you're documenting it other way. So this allows us to get much more detailed documentation because we can't do that type of work. In the shallower sites, at least archaeologists that run through ECU's program still use the use traditional recording techniques. And I, many times I'll join them on their projects. They'll do traditional recording. Then I'll go in and do a, a photo mosaic, or excuse me, a photogram, photogrammetric model of it as well. That way you have both of those things. Um, so it's not a dead technique. You didn't learn it for naught. And I would encourage you to stay, there's, they, they still have NAS projects that happen. There's some uh, diver groups that um, actually take on their own projects and get them funded. There's some, there's some really um, devoted amateur archeologists out there that do great work, that publish papers, present at national conferences. Um, they just don't get paid for it. <laughs> Great question, though. Anyone else for the question? So uh, let me unmute here real quick. So John, uh, why don't you take us out with a couple of your favorite photos that you haven't shown us so far? Okay. And we're at uh, about uh, eight ten. Maybe we'll wrap this up at about eight fifteen. Okay. Um, uh, and folks here are welcome to stay after and, and, and talk with John. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to, to take us out, and then I'll have a few words at the end. Sure. I'll move briefly through these. I'm sorry, Chris. Oh, as no, you're you can, good. As you're you can good. tell, I, I can talk. Um, <laughs> you're good. And sometimes you just got to shut me up. Um, you know, we had talked a little bit about Art of, uh, North Carolina's um, – hard bottoms, and so I wanted to show and compare them to some of the ones, some of the coral reef systems. And so this is, um, I go down there diving also with my family and my kids, um, and, uh, and we do training down there, and so I always take a camera with me, even if it's training or even if it's fun. This is um, some grouper off of Molasses Reef. Molasses Reef is actually named that because there was a, a ship that sunk called the Vitric that was actually carrying molasses, it sunk in 300 feet of water right off the edge of Molasses Reef, and molasses washed over the entire reef. So of course, after diving the Molasses Reef for five or six years, what do I want to dive? The Vitric. Now the Vitric's at 300 feet, which is right at the edge of what I'm able to dive. So I did dive it. However, my dive housing is not rated for 300 feet. It's rated for 280 feet, something along those lines. So I was to chicken, too scared to take my expensive camera housing down to that. So I don't have any images of it, but I was able to dive the Vitric, um, and it was quite a spectacular dive. To give you an idea, we talk about decompression. I, it was a 15-minute dive. It took me five minutes to fall to 300 feet. I had 10 minutes of the bottom, and I had 140 minutes of decompression on the way back up. So balancing your time on the bottom with the amount of decompression that you have um, has to come into play. Are you just hanging on the bar when you do 
We do drift diving, so we're hanging on a, on the edge, on, we're drifting and the boat's following us with our lift bags above us. We do a lot of underwater break dancing. We do, you know, Pictionary, we play games. Um, yeah, you st you're staring at your dive buddy for hours, so you're like break dancing and doing anything you can. Uh, one of the things I love about coral sy reef systems is the patterns that can be found here. This is a trumpet fish uh, next to a sea fan. I love the pa intricate patterns that are found um, on these uh, coral systems. When I dive with my youngest son, he wants to zip around the reef. I can descend on one patch and spend an hour in about a 10 by 10 area. There's so much to see if you go in that area. Talk about patterns, this brain coral with um, the Christmas tree worms that are on top of it as well. They just fascinate me. I probably spent 15 minutes photographing this thing and finding all the creatures in the nooks and crannies that are there. Photograph things that are also drifting. Um, this is a stinging nettle and they hurt really bad. This was in 2009 on a project on the Bedfordshire, which was a World War II British vessel that went down off of Ocracoke. It was sunk by the 701. And we were plagued with thousands of these that would wrap around our regulators, sting you on your regulator. I would take the regulator up, put my back up in my mouth. One would be wrapped around that, stinging me on the mouth. So I said, I'm gonna at least get some good images. Um, to give you an idea of how close this was touching the dome port on my, um, on my camera to get that image. Um, we also photograph things. I like photographing at the surface, not just down deep. This is floating sargasm, which is a brown macroalgae um, that we're studying as part of the, the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program. Uh, George Bonner, who's in the audience tonight, heads up that program for us at the Coastal Studies Institute. This sargasm attracts a variety of marine life. It's a relative oasis in the open ocean. There you can see some small game fish that are attracted underneath that. And our scientists are studying how some of these highly migratory species, like baby sea turtles, utilize sargasm and how the development of marine hydrokinetics could potentially impact them negatively or positively and looking at the holistically at the development of renewable energy off the coast of North Carolina. Um, and how these things might be affected. So using these small radio tags, Lynn, Dr. Lindsay Dubbs, who's the um, Associate Director for the Renewable Energy Program and a researcher with us at Coastal Studies and with UNC Chapel Hill, we released several of these and I had a great afternoon in the Gulf Stream chasing these little buggers around with my camera to get some fun photographs of them to bring back as well. So here you can see these uh, stay adhered on for um, up to about 90 days. I don't think uh, the longest ours lasted was a month or two. Their scutes on their back is, are made of vitodentin, similar to your fingernails, right? They grow and they'll slough off and then these will come off. The development of these small tags um, has basically been accelerated by batteries and accelerometers in, um, in cell phone technology. Until recently, the size of the tags were too big for these small turtles. And it's not that we're not interested in large turtles, but large turtles can hold their breath a long time and stay underwater most of the time. And GPS doesn't work underwater. So we need small turtles because they're at the surface much more often. And they're just darn cute, aren't they? <laughs> um, um, though this is my last slide. Um, this is my son, Mason, who's also a diver. This is a few years ago. He, um, he's, he's 14 now, so he doesn't look quite exactly like this. Uh, but I really enjoy spending time with my family in these environments. And one of the things that I really enjoy about my job and about photography is teaching others about photography and teaching others about the joy of capturing these images underwater. And I'm hoping to pass that on not only to my kids, but to also other folks that are interested in it. I teach a class an underwater photography class at ECU. Um, and we had high hopes, actually this next year through ECU, we were gonna teach uh, a, a photography and a small photo ver portion of it at CSI for the general public. COVID has postponed those plans, but we hope to in the near future for folks that might be interested to learn a little bit more about how to become a better photographer and maybe even take that camera underwater. You don't have to go to 300 feet to capture amazing things. There's really great stuff to see um, at shallow depths 
Uh, just yesterday, we had to, uh, Mike Mulia and myself, we had to dive at Jeanette's Pier to replace a mooring line on, um, on one of our, uh, what's called a spotter buoy. You have small buoys there that give wave height, speed, and direction, and sea surface temperature data. If you're a surfer, or a diver, or a fisherman, check them out on our website. Live data available 24-7 for you. And the amount of marine life in 10 feet of water, right off Jeanette's, we lucked out. It was also 20 feet of viz. Usually the viz is like three feet there. But you can have those same kind of experiences right there, uh, right off the coast. The Huron, um, which is another really accessible wreck. The Triangle wrecks, they're all really close by. It's a great hobby to get into. I wish it was a little cheaper, but it is something that, um, that you'll never master, but always enjoy doing it. And I really appreciate the time that you all took, especially the folks that came out here in person, and those of you that are online, joining us and listening to me blather on for the last 45 minutes or so. So John, if, if you don't mind, why don't you stop sharing your screen and turn your camera on and I'll, I'll, uh, we can finish this off. Okay. The recording piece of this anyway. So I just wanted to thank everybody who's here as John just did uh, and everybody who tuned in online and those of you who will view this in the future because we, we have made a recording and it will be available if you um, want to see it again or if you want to check it out for the first time, uh, thanks to those tuning in. Uh, just to, a little bit about this program, the uh, Dare County Arts Council's Courthouse Speaker Series is a brand new program this year. The program was made possible by North Carolina Humanities, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. North Carolina Humanities is a statewide nonprofit that connects North Carolinians with cultural experience experiences that spur dialogue, deepen human connections, and inspire community. And we're also uh, fortunate to have um, the North Carolina Arts Council supporting us, um, as I mentioned, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and our, um, our, our sponsor for all of our live streaming events this year is Town Bank, who's one of our signature sponsors. So I'm gonna end it with that. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, uh, thank you, John, for a wonderful presentation. As I said at the outset, uh, uh, this has been something that I've been hoping for for a long time. Uh, and thanks to everyone at CSI. Y'all do amazing work and we're just as fortunate as we can be to have you uh, in the heart of our community over there in Skyco. So I'm signing off. Any final words from you, John? The, thanks for having me, Chris. I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all in person in the somewhat near future. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.